You know, last night, uh, we were here, some of you were here, and maybe some of you will be here this evening, this afternoon, this evening, for our Worthy concert, which was fantastic worship and excellent music. And by the way, I should say, I mentioned, meant to mention this, if you missed out on tickets, there are some cancellations at the 6 o'clock. You might be able to get in. You can find out online if you're still interested in joining us. But then I come, we come this morning, and it's a whole different kind of music in that uh, I just was, I'm so impressed by the, the diversity and the level of talent, and they don't do it at all for our praise but to help us uh, sing the praises of God. But I would just say thank you to Eric and, and the whole team, the Country Bear Jamboree. We're grateful. I had breakfast with a, a friend a few weeks ago, and I'm just getting to know him. He's uh, new to our church, and I asked him the question, hey, tell me your story. I, I said that via email, actually. And I said, I'd love to get together and hear your story. And he emailed back, well, what do you mean by that? <laughs> what do you mean by my story? It's, and if you think about it, I, was just, I just meant get to know you. Tell me about your, your upbringing, your background, your, you know, your story. But it's a pretty profound question if you think about it. What's your story? Depending on your tone, you could say that different ways, couldn't you? What's his story, right? Or what's your story? I want to know you. I want to know about you. I want to understand what makes you, you. And I don't just mean by that. Most of the time, we don't just mean the events and the history and the facts about your background or your upbringing. We mean, who are you? What defines you? What makes you who you are? What's your story? Those of us who are followers of Jesus are having our stories shaped and defined and rewritten, at least we should be, by who he is, by what he's revealed to us in his word. I don't write my own story. I'm not, I don't determine my own fate. I join his story. We call it his story. But we, in our culture, people are trying to change their stories all the time, aren't they? Rewrite their story. Change it. Become somebody different. And, you know, you have to stop and think, is it that simple? I mean, can, can you just decide, I'm living a new story now? Can you just, you know, just by make a decision or somehow invent a new story for your life and for who you are? Many are trying to do just that. The story of the Bible is that we're all made by God in his image, all of us, every person. And that we're made by God, in the image of God, to be in relationship with God, but we screwed that up. You get all you need to know about the first half of the story in the first three chapters of the Bible. Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Who made you? Who made the world you live in? Why did he make you? What is your purpose? And what's wrong with the world and you in it? Our rebellion, the Bible calls it sin, our rejection, our need to have our own way. Yet despite all the brokenness and suffering in our lives and in the world, and we don't have to look very far to see that, even this time of year, maybe especially this time of year. I know for some of you, Christmas time isn't all that joyful. It's hard. So for all the darkness and pain in the world, there's something in us, in our hearts, that like a spiritual memory. We know things ought to be better than they are. We know we ought to be better than we are. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, God has set eternity in the hearts of men and women, but they have not understood it from beginning to end. Something in us remembers way back to our ancestors that it was different. It should be different. Could it be different? That's the story. Now, we cannot find our way back on our own. We're living in darkness, the Bible says. You can't figure it out or think your way there or pull yourself up by your bootstraps or meditate enough or do enough disciplines in your life to, like, fix the story. We long for things to be different, and we long for a different story, and that's essentially what the Bible's trying to say is there is one who can rewrite your story. And this is what the gospel gives us. The Bible uses a number of images to talk about this story, but one of the primary ones carried from the Old Testament in the beginning, from Genesis 1 all the way through to Revelation, is the contrast of darkness and light. You heard it a moment ago if you are paying attention in Isaiah 9. Let's read it again. Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 7 has been our text in this series called, He Shall Be Called. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1, But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. 
You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Do you hear the story in there? Do you hear it? Your past, present, and future hope are in there. People walking in darkness have seen a great light. To us a son is given, a child is born, and he will establish the kingdom of God with justice and righteousness. This is a picture of people who have turned their back on God and they find themselves in serious trouble. This is a story that's repeated all throughout the Bible and all throughout human history. We see it repeated today, don't we? In Isaiah chapter 8, the way it ends is there's the people of God are in trouble. They're the northern kingdom, Israel was divided at that time in history. The northern kingdom of Israel, it's confusing, there it was called Israel, was already conquered by the Assyrians. And the southern kingdom of Judah, where Jerusalem was, is under threat. And they're in trouble. And they're looking in the wrong places for help and guidance to the people of the world, to the people around them. And the more they look in the wrong places, the worse things get. Verse 20 of, of chapter 8 reads this way, to the teaching and the testimony of the world, they will not speak according to this world. It is because they have no dawn and there is no light in them. And then in verse 22, it ends this way, and they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness and the gloom of anguish and they shall be thrust into thick darkness. That's not a very cheery passage for Christmas time, but it's true. God's solution to all this darkness and all this trouble and all this brokenness is what? Here are the six things you must do to fix it. Here are the five principles, right? No. What is, he, what is God's solution? I'm going to give you a baby. I'm going to give you a child. What? I'm going to give you a son. A son is given. And this is our series. He shall be called in examining the character of the son. Just who is it that, that Isaiah is talking about that we are promised? Who is this child? What's the story with him? Timothy Keller writes, the modern world is full of people who say they believe in God and even many who say they believe in Jesus. But there's been no crisis of faith and no real evidence of change in their life. And therefore, we can only draw one conclusion. That despite what they say, they do not know him. Think about that. The, our churches are full of people who say, oh, yeah, yeah, especially this time of year. That's right. I, Jesus is the reason for the season. I believe in him. But it's brought me to no crisis of faith, and there's been no lasting change in my heart or in my life. Do you know him? Do you know this child that's promised? That's what we're after in this series. That's why these four names are so important. That's why we're digging in in this series to explain and explore who is he. And what difference does that make? Last week we talked about the wonderful counselor. Pastor Brian talked to you about wonderful counselor here. Not wonderful therapist or wonderful life coach, but the one who has divine wisdom, which we surrender to. Today we're looking at the mighty God, verse 6. Wonderful counselor, mighty God. The first thing you should, that should jump out to you is the odd juxtaposition. And it's easy to miss because it's so familiar. I was driving in this morning playing Handel's Messiah, Unto Us a Child is Born, that refrain, you know? I love that song. I can't sing it, but I just blast it in my car. And it's so familiar. We miss it. The child born in a manger is mighty God? Almighty God. Simply put, Jesus is God. Now, next week when we get to Everlasting Father, we're going to dabble in the Trinity. So that messes with your brain. Come back next week and we'll try to explain it in 30 minutes. <laughs> All right. But the child, baby in the manger, Jesus, is God Almighty. 
That's, that changes everything if that's true. He didn't come as an example. He didn't come as like a, a nice story to tell. He didn't come, you know, to be uh, like the best of us. He's God in flesh and blood. The God who made the heavens and the earth. He is mighty God. In fact, the Old Testament prophecy clearly and astonishingly teaches that Jesus is God. Messiah is God himself. The word mighty in the Hebrew is the word gibor. Everybody say gibor. <laughs> You're speaking Hebrew. It literally means not just strength and power, but a specific kind that's most often used as hero or champion or warrior, one who fights on your behalf. For example, when David faces Goliath of the Philistines, right, who will be the champion gibor of Israel? Or in Psalm 24, verse 8, who is this God we speak of? Who is he? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Gabor used there. Hero, champion, one who fights for you. Keep that in your mind. It's very, very important as we come back. Later on in Isaiah 42, we won't, uh, it won't be on the screen, but I'll just read it for you. Verse 13, Isaiah says this, The Lord goes out like a mighty Gabor man, like a man of war. He stirs up his zeal. He cries out and shouts aloud. He shows himself Gabor, mighty, against his foes. So the baby in a manger in Bethlehem is the warrior God, the hero, the champion, the one who fights for you and for me. This is the child born to us. Let's look at some of the ways he's mighty. We could spend... A lot of time on this, but just a few of the ways that he is mighty and fights for us. He's mighty in his word, first, mighty in word. Now, when you hear that, most of you, if I say, God is mighty in his word, most of you think about this, right? You think about the Bible, his word. And indeed, God's word is powerful, God's word is true, God's word can be trusted when we talk about the Bible. But when we say God is mighty in word, we mean more than just this book. Because before anything was written on any page, we're told in Genesis chapter 1, remember all you need to know about the beginning of your story, you find out in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. In Genesis 1, what do we read? In the beginning was God, right? And God created the heavens and the earth. And how did he do it? There was nothing, no material, no stuff yet, only God. What did he, how did he do it? He spoke, and God said, let there be light. And there was light, boom. And God said, Let's separate the light from the darkness. And God said, let's separate the dry land from the water. And God said, and God said, and God said. And then God said, let us make man in our image. God created the world and you and me in it by his word. And John chapter 1 tells us that in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God, and he was God in the beginning, and all things that are created have been created through him. Now that word is logos, the Greek word for knowledge or wisdom, and John used it to refer to not just text on a page, but the divine word made flesh, Jesus, because later in verse 14 of chapter 1, John says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, we're told the Son is the radiance of His, the Father's glory, and the exact representation of His being. And He upholds the universe by what? A word of His power. Your body, the molecules of your body are being held together by a word of His power. You would literally, like physiologically and emotionally and every other way, fly apart if God wasn't holding you together. He's holding all things together by his word. He is mighty in his word, not just the texts on the page, but he made you by his word. He sustains you by his word. He guides you by his word. He's mighty in his word. And his word, the word of God, the Bible, is given to us by the word, Jesus, to sh reveal to us who God is, what he's like, the mighty God. Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be, which goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty. It shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing which I sent it. 
God's word is going to do what God says, what God purposes, what God wills. He is mighty in his word. All that exists, including you, were made by his word. Think about that when you read this Isaiah passage. Unto us a child is born, a son is given. How nice. Who is this child? He's mighty God. He's mighty in his word. This is not the same thing, by the way. So when you hear that God is mighty in his word and his word can be trusted, it's tempting for us to think, yes, yes, I, I want the word of God in my life. I like to have some of the word of God in my life. But we tend to think of it like advice. Like, this is really good advice. And I will take it under advisement, God. Right? I will consider it, God. That's not what you do. If he's almighty God, you don't consider his advice. You surrender to him. You bow before his word. He is the mighty God. Second, he's mighty in works. This is a consistent theme throughout all of the Old Testament and the New. There's so many passages. In fact, that'd be a fascinating study. Just go through and trace the number of times it would be there would be a lot <laughs> in which God is revealed in his works, in which the people of God are, are commanded to praise him for his works or reminded of his works, reminded who he is by his works. In Jeremiah 32, verses 17 through 18, the weeping prophet Jeremiah says this, Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You show steadfast love to thousands, but you repay the guilt of fathers to their children after them. O oh, great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts. I love that Jeremiah begins this phrase, leave it up there for a minute, with this exclamation, Ah, Lord God. He's exclaiming, you did all this. You made all this. Do you, do you ever have, ah, Lord God moments? You ever have moments where you're just overwhelmed by who he is? Like it catches you off guard almost, takes your breath away. You look at your child sleeping or a sunrise or hear a song or stuff you don't even anticipate. For whatever reason, it causes you to go, ah, Lord God, you did this. Did that ever happen to you? When's the last time you had an ah, Lord God moment? Where God took your breath away by his power and might. Has it been a while? Last night, I'm sitting right over there, listening to this incredible concert, Worthy. And in the back, the very back, is a little boy, and actually not that little, but his name is Dylan, Dylan Huber. Dylan has cerebral palsy, and he can't speak, but he can press on his little pad, which attached to his wheelchair, and he can, it, it has a speaker, and it's, he, can, he can type words and speak words that way. And after every song, and he's behind me a few rows, these soaring orchestra and choir singing, these soaring songs of worship, I, I hear the little speaker go, it's very good. It's very good. <laughs> yeah, I like music. Praise God. Very good. Like those are the things that he keeps pressing and saying over and over after every song coming from his heart, sitting by his parents in the back, right back in the corner. And I had an, ah, oh, Lord God moment. It is good. Dylan's right. He's right. It's good. God is good. Here's the funny thing. I drove here from my daughter's basketball game where it wasn't very good. <laughs> to get here in time for that, for that concert. Irritated, angry, show up, all right, I gotta say something spiritual in this concert. You know? <laughs> and I'm sitting back here and I'm hearing this incredible music and this boy who can't speak say, it's good, it's good, praise God, it's good. And God, is that little speaker from his, from his wheelchair was speaking to my heart. I'm the mighty God, Jeff. Have you forgotten that? When's the last time you had an ah, Lord God moment? I think you need one. And that's what he wants to do for us. The child born in the manger is mighty God, mighty in his word, mighty in his works. I can't see my notes. <laughs> that's the whole point in this story for us is that Jeremiah is telling us who it is. God's solution is not a child in some like sentimentalized way, oh nice, away in a manger, you know, little Lord Jesus. It's mighty God in there. That's his solution, to give us himself. 
And if you look back at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 4, I, we won't see on the screen, but I'll read it for you. There's this weird line. He talks about Zebulun and Naphtali, and I talked about that last week, what that means. But then there's this, I'm going to break the yoke of burden and destroy the boots of the warrior, every garment rolled in blood. It's imagery for like all the strife and the wars are going to cease, burn up and be gone, because I'm going to bring peace. We'll talk about that in two weeks. But he says, as on the day of Midian, did you hear that? Sometimes you just pass over, I don't know what that means, it's something in the Bible, we just move on to the stuff I get. Well, that's a reference to Judges 6 through 8. It's the story of a guy named Gideon. At this time in Israel's history, they have this cycle of screwing things up. And as they rejected God, they fell under oppression by other nations, and then they would cry out to God, we're wrong, we see our, our, our error, please save us. And God would send a deliverer, literally a savior to them, although a lesser savior, a flawed savior, in the form of these judges who would deliver them from whatever country was oppressing them, whatever nation. And then they would screw it up again. And the judges is just this cycle. It's really repeated even today. And Gideon is, he's, he's really a nobody. But the angel comes and says, hail mighty warrior. Same word, Gabor. And Gideon, you know what he's doing? He's in a wine press, which is a hole in the ground. He's hiding in a hole in the ground from the Midianites, who numbered in the 150 to 200,000 uh, strong in their army. They were the first to use camels in battle. They not only would wipe you out, but trample all your fields, so you not only would be defeated in battle, but you couldn't even grow anything and starve. They were, they were a dominant force on the world scene at that time, and they were oppressing Israel. And he says to Gideon, Hail, mighty warrior, the Lord is with you. You're going to defeat the Midianites. And Gideon decides, well, first he complains, says, I think you got the wrong guy, but that's another story. And then God says, no, we got the right guy. And he goes, well, let's draw an army. And he gets 32,000, which is a lot, but the size of Geneva, all of Geneva, coming together, fighting men. But what's 32,000 against 150,000? You'd have to have some good strategy. But God says to Gideon, what? You know what he says? Well, you've got too many. <laughs> what? You need to whittle this down. So anybody who you know, has crops to harvest or family at home is allowed to leave. Tell them. And 10,000 men leave. This is, can't be a good idea, God, Gideon thinks. And then God says, okay, 22,000 still too many. And the whole story is God whittling down the army from 32,000 to, anybody know? 300. This is the real 300 story. 300. 300? This, is, this will never work. This is ridiculous. This is a mistake. This is craziness. No, how can you go with 300 against 150,000? And to make it even weirder, God tells Gideon, tell them all to get a pot and put some fire in it. What's that going to do? And the story is amazing, but what happens is God delivers them. The whole point of that is that nobody could say we did this. Nobody in their right mind would ever come up with this plan or could ever think that somehow the Israelites were clever. It had to be God. It had to be God. That's why he, Isaiah references it. As in the days of Midian, when you knew it had to be God, this is the child born to you. Because you, you're facing overwhelming odds. You are the people living in darkness. You're lost. You have no chance. Unless God does something that only God can do. You're facing impossible odds. Only God can win this one. Now many of us, without realizing it, say we want Jesus in our lives, but we want him on our terms. We want his word and we want his works, but we want them like along with our agenda. We want God, you know, as a power source and a, an advice giver on our terms. But that's not how you respond to the mighty God. You surrender before him. You lay yourself down and say, only you, God. Because Jesus is not a power source for your life goals. Now, you might be nodding with that, but I want you to hear that. So many of you live as if that's what God is, a power source for your life goals. That's not who he is. He will never be that. He's mighty God or he's nothing to you. You can't turn him into a way to get what you want, to make your life a little better. Now, I'm not saying God doesn't want to do good things in your life. He does, but you must surrender to him first. This brings us to the last little point here. He's mighty in love. This is the most important thing. He's not almighty God who you cower in fear before. I, I, I can't help thinking, I think I've quoted this before, but I, Monty Python is stuck in my head, you know, the, the search for the Holy Grail. 
when, when King Arthur prays, Oh, Lord God, you are so huge. Please do not crush us in thy mercy, right? We, you wouldn't say it that way, but we think of God like this, like he's just, he's powerful and mighty and he's going to get me if I do wrong. So I better toe the line. The message of Christmas, the message of Isaiah 9, is that the mighty God comes to you as a weak, frail, vulnerable child. Who thinks of that? That's crazier, crazier than 32,000 down to 300. Who decides this is the way to save the world? Who comes up with that? Only God. Only God, because it has to be him. This is the way God decides to display his mighty power. He comes to us, and he just lavishes his love on us. That's what the incarnation is. God with us, God coming into flesh and blood, is the ultimate act of love and grace and mercy. It's like God just backs up the universe dump truck of grace and just pours it out on you when you surrender to him. Just buries you in his love. Engulfs you with it. This is what real power looks like. It's not do what I say because I'm in charge. It's the God of the universe, the almighty one, makes himself weak and vulnerable and comes to you. Remember what the word, Hebrew word for mighty means, right? Gabor means what? Champion, hero, one who fights for you. How does the child born to Mary fight for you? How does he win your battles? How does that happen? That's what the cross is. Remember the garden. I don't want to do this, God, Father. If there's some way out, take it away. Yet not my will, but your will be done. That's the fight of all fights. That's the battle of all battles. To give himself for you. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit, and is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind. We were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind, but God, the best lines in that whole ver passage are, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. You hear that? The message is you are dead. Now, you, we hear that and we think I was drowning. Like, I don't, I don't have it all together. I struggle. I got some issues and God throws me a life preserver. And I reach out and grab it. Oh, thank you. That's not what it says. It says you're dead in your sins and trespasses. Let's go up to Lake Geneva, frozen over this time of year, or, or the nearest lake, right? Frozen over. And it's not meaning you're drowning. It's meaning you're at the bottom of Lake Michigan, underneath the ice, underneath the freezing cold water, dead. Dead is dead. Not mostly dead, like in Princess Bride, but all dead, right? You're dead, dead. Can a dead person swim to the surface? Can a dead person reach and grab a life preserver? Can a dead person do anything but be dead? Class? No. I know. You're dead. So what is the message of, of, of God's power? Not I'm helping you out if you help yourself, but I break through the ice. I swim down through those frozen depths. I find your lifeless body. I bring you to the surface, and I put life in you. That's the gospel. Not God gives you a little grace and helps you out if you hold on to him, but you're dead in your trespasses and sins. Walking in darkness, powerless. You don't even know you're dead. You're a dead man, a woman walking. But Jesus breaks through and comes. This, by the way, is what makes Christianity utterly unique among all religions of the world. Every other religion is some kind of spiritual ladder climbing. If I pray enough, give enough, observe the five pillars of the Quran, follow the eightfold path of enlightenment for, the, for Buddhism, be reincarnated in Hinduism, whatever, I'm climbing up to get to God, to escape judgment, to make it to nirvana, to be enlightened. It's all the same system, essentially. You and I climbing. Only Christianity says, you can't. Why? Because you're dead. You can never climb high enough to ascend to God. But God absolutely can and does descend low enough to save you. That ought to give you an awe God moment. That ought to give you an awe God moment. Ah, sovereign Lord, you did this. Only you could do this. 
And if you are here this morning and your version of Christianity is ladder climbing, trying to make it be good enough so that God would throw you a life preserver, that's not what the message is. That's not the gospel. The baby comes in a manger not to make us feel sentimental once a year, but to be, live a sinless life and go to a cross and die in our place and be resurrected. Why? So that you could be brought from death to life. So when you hear mighty God in Isaiah 9, that's what you think about. Mighty enough to do what? To create the heavens and the earth? Yeah. To hang the stars in place? Absolutely. But even more than that, mighty enough to bring dead people to life, to find you, to save you, to rescue you, and to bring you to life. I love this verse, which we heard sung a moment ago in Zephaniah. It's from Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 18. The Lord your God is in your midst. He is a mighty Gabor, same one, mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. Let me just ask you, how, how does the mighty God become your God? your mighty God? How does he go from a mighty God to my mighty God, my mighty Savior? Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 9, right, he says a son is given. He's a gift. What do you do with a gift? Well, you work for a gift. No, no. You receive a gift. But some gifts are harder to receive than others, aren't they? For example, let me pick on the guys for a minute. If uh, Christmas morning you come down, there's two presents for you, one from your wife and one from your kids, and you open the one from your wife first, and it's a book, and it says, How to Lose 100 Pounds. <laughs> and you think, hey, thanks, honey. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and you, you think, well, there's another gift for my kids. And you open that gift, and you're excited, and it's a, a set of CDs that says, Overcoming Selfishness. <laughs> thanks, kids. Now, you could just roll your eyes and be disgruntled, but to receive those gifts with gratitude means you're saying what? Oh, I'm fat and selfish. <laughs> right? Well, we laugh at that, and I hope I don't get those. Right? <laughs> but what is the message of Christmas? I mean, if we're talking, it's, you're dead. You're walking in darkness. You can do nothing to save yourself. You're hopelessly lost, and you're deceived until God breaks in. How do you receive that gift? It's not easy to receive. I mean, it's simple, but it means humbling yourself. It means acknowledging your need. It means recognizing God is not my life coach or my assistant or my therapist. He's mighty God that can do one thing. That's fall on my face before him and acknowledge that I'm lost without him and only he can save me. And when you do that, what do you get? Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, Prince of Peace. Think about that for a minute. What is God saying? You're dumb. He's a wonderful counselor. You're weak. He is mighty God. You're alone. He is your everlasting Father. You're full of anxiety and conflict. He is a Prince of Peace. He's everything you're not and you need. And that's what he wants to give you. Let's pray. Mighty God, the one who is mighty in word and in works and in love. We praise you that you fight for us on our behalf to win a battle that we could never win. We are lost without you. Thank you that you dis decided to display your mighty power by making yourself weak and vulnerable and frail, a baby. And by living the life we're supposed to live but could not, and dying the death we deserve, and rising from the grave to be for us our mighty God. We praise you. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.